Hello there, YouTubers, and welcome to another episode of Dumb As Code. Uh, today we're going to be doing another Pi game tutorial. Uh, last time, I, last video I published was on building Snake using Pi game. This time we're going to be building a game called Dodger. It's pretty straightforward. It's a fun arcade game where you are a character that dodges things falling from the sky. Pretty straightforward, simple concept. This episode is going to be slightly more complicated. The game is going to be slightly more complicated than a snake game. Uh, we're going to have to take continuous input on movement so that the player properly moves. If you need a little bit more of an easy introduction into Pi game, check out in the description. Uh, I'll link you back to the snake tutorial so that you can see how to uh, build a really simple game in Pi game before you jump in here. So I'm assuming you already have a little bit of experience with Pi game. And you have experience with Python, Python 3, okay? So we're going to go ahead and get the project started here. Uh, I use PyCharm. It's a great IDE built by the guys who make IntelliJ. So it's super well supported and uh, it makes things easy. We're going to build it everything in a virtual environment so that we can keep our library separate from our system libraries for Python, okay? Uh, you can... This uh, checkbox here, create a main.py, is completely optional. You can create your own main in a second. Uh, I just like to leave it in here as a starting place. I'll show you what it looks like here in a second. So let's go ahead and create this. Uh, this is going to load up our IDE. And there we go. All right. So now we have our virtual environments being created. Everything looks like it's going to be working um, as we expected. So once this uh, finishes installing all the required tools. Uh, we'll have our main.py up here. Uh, there's nothing really to it. Uh, the one that gets generated for us just prints hello and your name. Okay. So uh, let's open up our terminal window here in the bottom and install the libraries that we need. And then we can jump straight into uh, building what we actually need here. So we're going to do a pip install. The only library we're going to need is Pygame. Uh, if you just do pip install Pygame, that should work on most systems. On Mac, there is a problem where if you're not on the 2.0 version of Pygame, uh, it actually won't render to the screen properly. So I have to uh, designate the version for the development branch. And at the time of this, uh, there's a uh, several development branches. I go with the one that is the most stable right now, which is dev six. So go ahead and hit pip install. It'll run through the installation. I've already got everything installed locally since I've been, uh, playing with, with Pygame game before this point. But if you don't, you'll see it actually install it and then, uh, everything will get pulled in for you. So that's it. That's all we need to get started here. Let's go ahead and delete all of these comments. We don't need all this. Uh, we don't need all of this. There we go. So we're going to have our main and inside of here, all we're going to do is call a run function and then let's go ahead and def run. Now we're going to, we're going to pass here. Um, we don't, we don't need it to do anything just yet. We just want the application to run. Okay. So there we go. Uh, let's import Pygame. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Phone calls coming in. Yay. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and import Pygame. All right. Uh, and then for this game, we're going to use random the random package. We're going to randomly generate where the squares are falling on the screen. So that's all we need for that. Uh, now, there, I'm going to put some global variables at the top here. Uh, this just makes it a little easier to work with actually using Pygame. So Pygame, in case you don't know, is a wrapper around SDL, which is a the simple direct media layer. It's a very low-level game development library. It allows you to interface directly with the graphics card, audio players, things like that. And Pygame is a slightly higher Python wrapper around all of that. Uh, so we're not dealing with uh, some of the higher level game engines like Godot or Unity or Unreal, we've got to do a lot of this, uh, a lot of these things manually ourselves. So we have to declare how big do we want things. So we're going to do a 600 by 600 window so we get that nice lovely square window that uh, 
you, you saw in the little demo. And I'm going to set our frames per second. Uh, when we run through a game loop, we have to tell uh, Pygame how many um, frames are, how much time is in between each frame? How much time should we have between renderings? Uh, 40 FPS is a, is a pretty good number. Uh, 60 is, is a solid number for a really action intense game, and 10 is a good number for a game that is turn based or it, it just waiting for input from a player. Okay? So we're going to do FPS equals 40, something somewhere in the middle here. Now we need to, we're going to have two things, uh, two types of objects declared in our Pi game. We're going to have enemy objects and we're going to have player, uh, the player object. So let's go ahead and declare some um, top level uh, variables here. Uh, we're going to do spawn rate. This is how fast our enemy is going to uh, pop in, uh, at, at fall down from the top of the screen. So... Uh, this is how many cycles through the loop do we wait between each spawn. Two is pretty fast. Uh, one is super fast. Um, you can go, I would suggest going anywhere from two to ten and then adjusting other numbers. You'll have lots of time to play with this after we build it to, to figure out what is a good balance for this game. Uh, these are the numbers that we're just going to start with so that you have a good place to start. Okay. Uh, each enemy is going to have a different size. Okay. Uh, we're going to start with, we are, we'll have some enemies are going to be very small and you don't have to worry about them as much. Some enemies are going to be very big. So, uh, we're going to start with uh, four pixels as the minimum size and a maximum size. We're going to say 15 pixels. Okay. On a 600 by 600 pixel, 15 is still not very large, but, uh, you'll be able to, uh, to see the clear difference between a 15 and a four pixel enemy. Okay. And then the last two things we need are how fast are our enemies moving? So they can move anywhere from two pixels per frame all the way to uh, 10 pixels per frame. Okay. And there we go. Oops. Helps if I do an equal sign here. Okay. So there we are. Uh, we have a minimum and a maximum speed uh, between 2 and 10 pixels per frame. Now let's do a couple of things for the player. Uh, we're going to set up player speed equals 3. And we're going to set up uh, player size equals 10. And player max up equals 150 pixels. All right, what this means is we're limiting the player to the bottom 150 pixels of our window. Out of a 600 pixel window, that gives us not quite a third of the screen for the player to move around in. Uh, this just allows you to move up, down, left, right uh, in this area, and it will stop you from moving up past the maximum point of 150 pixels. Uh, again, all of these numbers are something you can easily play with once you actually get this up and running, and you can experiment and find what do you like. Do you want the player to move all the way to the top of the screen and move around wherever they want to go, or do you want to limit them to the bottom of the screen like this? Uh, I think the game is a little bit more fun if you limit them to the bottom and you have pretty fast spawn rate for your enemies, okay? And the final thing we're going to declare at the top here are some colors. We want the background color of the game to be black. Uh, and then we'll, we'll draw our text on top. Oops, capital C, color. And we'll make it white. Now, all this is doing for us is um, setting up these, uh, this is, this comes from color dict, uh, which is a dictionary of all the colors and it's giving us a tuple. Um, so this is initializing a tuple for us with the right values for our red, green, and blue. Okay. So, um, it's just a shortcut way, an easy way, um, to determine, you know, what, uh, what tuple, tuple to bring in. And it, it looks much nicer than just having a raw tuple. Dark red. 
We're going to do a dark red and a dark green. How about that? If you want to change the colors of these, you are more than welcome to go and modify them to whatever color tuple you want. Uh, when you use the color constructor here, you can actually put the tuple in and define your own custom colors if you want to see something different. I just go pretty simple. I have red enemies and a green good guy. Okay? Uh, so that's it for getting everything set up for uh, the variables we're going to be using. Um, now what we need to do is uh, we need to set up Pygame. Okay, this is pretty simple, straightforward stuff. It'll be basically the same in every Pi game that you set up. You're going to set up your Pi game init in the run loop, and after you leave, you're going to quit. Okay, then we need to set up our clock. This is going to be the thing that determines how much time has passed between each uh, iteration of the run loop. Okay. Our screen, this is how we're going to draw our window. And we do screen width by screen height. That's it. That's all we need for that. All right. Uh, and then let's oh, display dot set. Caption and in here we're gonna say Dodger Pie Game Example. So this is the title of the window once it actually gets drawn. Then we need to create a surface for us to draw everything on. So surface constructor, and we're gonna pass it the size of the screen that we just created. So we're gonna draw our surface over the entire display area of the window that we just created. Then we have to run the surface.convert so that we can turn this into something we can draw on. Okay, so now we have a screen, we have a surface. Let's actually draw it now, okay? Our main loop, I like to use a variable up here uh, to control my loop, you can always do wall true and just have it run forever and do a forced shutdown inside of the loop if you want to close everything. Uh, some more here. Um, this, uh, this is our event loop. What we're going to do is we're going to grab every event that exists and we're going to look specifically for um, pygame.quit. This means that you clicked the red X button at the top of the window, and if that happens, we want the game to stop running. We can also Alright. If the event type is key down and event.key equals pygame.k_escape. All right, that is the escape key. If the escape key is pressed, we also want to leave. That's it. That's it for now. We're going to come back and we're going to add some more uh, event handling in here. We want to we want to be able to reset the game. We're going to add a few things that we didn't add in the snake game. We're going to add a game over screen and a key to press to reset the game. Things like that, just to make it a little bit more like a real game with menus. Um, we're not going to go all the way into menu creation until the next tutorial, but this will give you a good start. Okay, um, then we want to tick the clock. Okay, so we've checked for events. If we're at this point, we know that we haven't exited the game, and um, we're going to tick the clock. We're going to start actually drawing stuff to the world. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, we're going to fill the background, uh, and in this case, just black. Um, you can choose any color you want here, but black is easier on the eyes for me. Then... We're going to blit the surface. Uh, 
Blit is just a fancy word for draw it to the uh, draw everything to the screen. Um, I don't know the history of Blit. I'm gonna have to look that up for the next video and and let you know why why do they use the word Blit? I I actually don't know. Um, and then once we've done that, the last thing to do is update. That's it. That's all we have to do. Let's go ahead and hit run. Let's see what happens. Make sure that we programmed everything correctly at this point. Uh, if we missed anything, we'll know. If not, we'll just see a black screen. Not very exciting, but uh, this will give us a, a, a place to actually draw our game. All right, let's exit. Let's make sure everything works. All right, everything exited properly. Yay, look at that. We did our event loop correctly. So there's, there's not much here at this point. Um, it, this is just a basic uh, run loop, okay? Uh, you're going to need to do that for every Pi game that you build, so practice, practice, practice. Learn how to do that every time, okay? <laughs> now, let's actually uh, define a couple of things that we need here. Uh, we're going to define our classes. I I like to split things up into three classes. This allows me uh, to do some playing. If I want to do things like experimenting with artificial intelligence, having the having it learn how to play the games, things like that, it, it's easier to have a world object that represents everything in the world. That way I can create multiple copies of them. If I'm running something like uh, the neat algorithm, uh, I can have multiple copies of the world so they all can run in parallel. Uh, that's the reason for splitting things up this way. You could definitely create your all of your world logic inside of your run loop. I just prefer to separate it out. It makes things a little easier. So we need three classes here. We need a player. And we're gonna we're just gonna pass over the top of these for right now. Uh, we don't need them to do much more than just exist right now. Uh, we need an enemy class. We're gonna pass over the top of it, and we need a world class. Now, as I said, um, world is gonna hold the game state. Uh, enemy is gonna be uh, represent each enemy that falls down from the top, and player is gonna represent you as the player. Um, each of these is going to have a, a couple of things that it does. Um, the first thing we're going to do is, in the world, we're going to um, set up, oops, underscore, underscore, init. So we create our init function. Um, and in here, we're just going to pass for now. Uh, but uh, we will very soon actually do something in here. Um, the next function I'm going to define is reset. And what this allows us to do is when the game is over and we hit the reset button, we can reset all of the variables in the world and restart the game. Okay. Um, we're also just going to pass in here. Um, but at this point, I, I didn't want to do this just yet. It, it doesn't matter at this point, but all we're going to call here is self.reset. We just... When we initialize, this is typically the the init is where we typically set all of the very the self variables on, uh, you know, like the player, the the list of enemies, the score, how many enemies are up, um, how how fast we're spawning, all of that kind of stuff is defined in the init function, so that we can create our variables for the class. Uh, but we're going to do it in the reset function, just so that it's easy for us to, when we want to reset the game, call this function and everything goes back to the beginning. Okay. So all we're going to do is call that. And then we need a couple of helper functions here. Uh, because we're going to add a game over screen, we're going to create an is game over function. Uh, and we're going to return self dot game over. Okay, uh, and then we can in here in the reset function we can define self dot game over as false. So there we go. Uh, now PyCharm does not like it when I do things this way. Uh, I know better than you, PyCharm. This is the way I want to do it. So quit, quit giving me the yellow squiggles. I don't want them. All right. Uh, so that function is super easy. Uh, the next things we're going to need to do is have an update function. We'll add some logic to it in a little bit. And uh, finally, we're going to need a draw function. Okay. 
Uh, we're also we're going to need to pass self, and we're going to also pass the surface that we're going to draw things on. Okay. This is not a very exciting class yet, but it will get more exciting in a second. Oh, there is one more thing we need here. One more thing. We need to handle key presses. Um, and I like to do things this way because uh, the way the event loop works is when you grab an, uh, an, uh, one of the events off of the event loop, it's pulled off forever. Uh, you can put it back onto the event loop, but I prefer just to pass it down to the world and let the world handle it from there. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to pass the event down to the world object. All right, look at that. Isn't this exciting? Uh, now let's actually use our world object, and then that way, as we flush it out, our game will start to get more and more content. Okay? So inside of here, um, we're going to set up, after we create our surface, inside the run function, we are going to say world equals a new world object. Okay? Uh, and then... We're going to set up a font in here as well. How exciting. We're going to draw text to the screen. Look at that. All right. Um, one thing we should do here, uh, since we're setting up the font now, we should probably have something we want to draw on the screen. So up here, we're going to say self dot score equals zero. This will just give us a way, something that we can draw to the screen. We're going to draw zero up here. Okay. Let's come back down to the run function now. Um, what should we do next? Okay. Um, we want to... If... Event type is key down okay and event key uh, this is the ordinal of the r key we're going to set the r key as our reset key so if you hit r going to reset the game we could do something here where we also make sure the game is actually in game over state before we allow you to reset but um that's a lot of work and so we're just going to reset the world every time they hit r if they want to keep resetting over and over and over again, completely up to them. All right. And the last block of this event loop is we're going to call world.handleKeys with the event passed straight in. So that the world object can actually handle everything else that happens in here. Sound good? I hope so. There we go. Okay. Um, so we have a tick that happens. The next thing we're going to do is check. Is the game not over? If the game is not over, we're going to call world.update. Okay? If the game is over, we don't want the game to update the positions of everything of the enemies and the player. We just want it to freeze where it is and let the world wait for the reset key to get hit before it actually resets. Okay? And after we fill the surface, then we can draw on the world. All right, that's pretty fun. Now, let's say, let's create some text. Let's put that on the screen so that we can see something when we run this again. So we're going to create a score. And we're going to draw it by replacing world.score in that string. And then set the weight and the color. There you go. We created some text. Let's draw it on the screen. Again, screened up blit. No idea where blit comes from, but it's fun to say blit, blit, blit. There we go. Let's run it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Fun. Exciting. Oh, huh. I'm on the edge of my seat. Beach ball of doom. Oh, look, we have a score of zero. How exciting is this? 
we're making progress. Now, the, uh, the important thing here to note is that the world is being called, update on the world is being called, and draw on the world is being called. So as we add actual objects in here, they're going to exist. They're going to get drawn. It's going to be fun. Um, so let's go up and actually start filling in our logic now. Okay. What, what do we need to create here? Uh, we need two things being created in the world. Um, so let's add into the reset function self.player equals a new player. Okay. And then self.enemies equals empty array. Now, I'm doing an empty array here because enemies, there's going to be a lot of them, all right? Uh, they're just going to spawn and fall from the sky, and so we need a way to keep track of all the things that are on the screen right now as far as enemies, and that's what this is going to do. Uh, so then we have game over, we have score. Uh, what else are we going to need? Uh, we're going to need a counter. And what this counter is going to do is it's going to keep track of when was the last time we drew an enemy on the screen? So this counter is going to increment every frame. And when this counter is greater than uh, our enemy spawn rate, we're going to draw another enemy. Okay. It's a really simple way of spawning something on a, on a fairly regular basis is creating these counters and then making, incrementing them every frame, resetting them back at the beginning. Okay. Uh, there are um, four other things we need. Um, you're just going to have to trust me on these for right now. Uh, we need to know, are we moving up? Are we moving down? Are we moving left? Or are we moving right? As I said, uh, if you didn't run through the snake tutorial, um, what we're doing here is we're setting up uh, directions that we can move. Because we're going to be moving continuously, unlike snake, uh, which takes the key press one time and changes your direction to whatever direction of key you pressed. So if you hit up the next frame, it's going to make you turn up. If you hit down, it's going to make you turn down. It it's very straightforward move mechanics in the game of Snake. In this game, we're going to be able to continuously move in any direction. Up, left, right, down. And if you're pushing left and up at the same time, we want to increment you diagonally up and to the left. Okay? So we need to keep track of each of the states. Are we moving up, moving down, moving left, moving right? Up and down are going to cancel each other, and left and right are going to cancel each other. So you can press them at the same time. It's just going to do nothing. You're not going to move anywhere. Um, but we do need to know each of these individually, okay? Um, so now let's actually um, update here. Uh, let's go to the update function. Now, we're going to make this, the score grow pretty fast. Every frame that you're alive and the game is updating, you're going to get a point, okay? That's a, that's a pretty good way of drawing the score here. Uh, if I run this right now, you'll see what I mean. Uh, we're going to hit go, and you're going to see score is going up pretty fast. Uh, this is going to be a high-scoring game. Uh, that's all right. Uh, it depends on how fast your enemies fall down, how high your score can actually get. Um, you can slow this down a little bit. You can do something similar to what we're about to do with the enemy counter and slow down the score to only increment every two or three frames uh, as opposed to incrementing every frame. Okay? Uh, so that we're going to do, um, what else are we going to do? Okay. Let's say for each E in self dot enemies, uh, and then in here, we're just going to pass for now. So we're going to iterate through the list of enemies. We're going to do something in here. We're going to update each of the enemies each time. We go through here. Uh, we haven't defined any functions in the enemy class yet, so if we try to do anything here, it's going to fail. But uh, we're going to have to do this. Um, and then next thing we're going to do is we're going to increment self.enemy counter plus equals 1. Okay, so this is going to be the same thing that we're doing 
with the score, we're incrementing the enemy counter every frame. Uh, the thing is, we're going to say if self dot uh, enemy counter is greater than the uh, enemy spawn rate. This is what I was just saying. If if your enemy counter is higher than your spawn rate, we're going to reset the counter. Reset it back to zero. And self dot enemies. And we're going to append a new enemy to the end of the array. All right, uh, so this is going to create a new enemy object, stick it onto the enemy's array every uh, every three frames. Okay, uh, so we increment the counter. Once we pass uh, the value, we're going to add another enemy to the top of the screen. Okay, and then inside of our draw function, um, let's go ahead and do this, and then define uh, and start to fill out our enemy class up above. Um, so in draw, we're going to do two things. We're going to do self dot player dot draw on the surface, and we're going to do for e in self dot enemies. We're going to say e dot draw on the surface. Okay. Now let's create some functions for these, so nothing breaks up here. Um, We're going to create an init function in our player, and we're going to create a draw function and take in the surface. And we're not going to actually draw anything yet. We're just going to pass. Uh, we're going to do the same thing. So we can just copy these and paste these into the enemy. So we're going to initialize the enemy and then draw the enemy. All right. Uh, this will allow us to create new players, create new enemies, and then we have a draw function so that this gets drawn. Okay. Sound good? I hope so. So, what are what are these things actually going to do? Um, let's start with the enemies. They're more they're much more exciting to see on the screen because there's going to be a lot of them. It's tons of fun to actually draw them and see what happens. So, um, in here uh, on our um, uh, on our update functions for the world, uh, let's go ahead and make the enemies do something, and then fill this all out so that our enemies. Um, actually uh, show up on the screen once we get them drawing okay and they and they do what they're supposed to do so what we're gonna do is we're gonna call enemy move enemies have a very simple move pattern they fall and so all we have to do is call move and then update that okay um, if e dot is off screen we're gonna create a new function here called is off screen uh, and we're going to check to see, is the enemy off the screen? And if they are, we're going to remove them from the enemies array. Okay. Uh, what this allows us to do is every enemy that falls off the bottom, instead of keeping them forever and having them fall past infinity uh, until the computer explodes because you're working with ridiculous numbers or the application crashes because you have so much in your memory space we're going to just remove these and let the garbage collector clean come by and clean them up later okay um so that is what we're going to do for each enemy there's going to be one more piece of logic here later we're going to check for intersects between the player and the enemies here as well but we're not going to worry about that just yet all right um so we're going to have to create a couple of things in here um, on top of the draw, we're going to say is off screen, okay? And all we're going to do here is we're going to say return self.position, oops, I haven't defined it yet, so it's not there, position of y, which is 1 in the position array, is greater than the screen height. Uh, remember in Pygame, you count down, so you start zero as the top, and your screen height, the max height, is at the bottom. So if our current uh, position is past the screen height, then we know that we have fallen off the bottom of the screen. Let's go ahead and initialize that object. So we're going to say self.size, 
we're going to say random dot rand int and we're going to start with the uh, enemy min size and enemy max size. So we're going to set our size between the minimum and maximum. We're going to pick a random integer between those values. We're going to set our speed to the same thing. And we're going to say enemy min speed to uh, enemy max speed. There you go. So you're, you're setting your size, your speed. Your color is going to be the same for every bad guy. And finally, your position. So we're going to set a random position. We're going to set it anywhere between uh, x0 and x max screen size. But if we do it as screen width, because of the way that uh, squares are drawn, uh, they start at the top left. So we actually want to move this slightly to the left, the size of the object that we set. Okay. So uh, instead of, because we draw at the top left, we're going to draw to the right uh, size number of pixels. So we want to move the whole object to the left that much. So our random position, we can't go all the way off the screen. Uh, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to draw from the top of the screen. We're going to start at zero and subtract self dot stop size so that we start just off the top of the screen and fall onto it. Okay, that way we don't see things flashing onto the top of the screen as whole objects. Okay, uh, so that is how we draw our position. Now let's actually draw uh, our our object. Uh, we're going to need two more things in here, two more functions. We're going to need a move and um, move. We're going to pass on for now, and then the final function we should have is get rect. Now what this is going to do is this is going to give us the current rectangle based off of our self dot position and self dot size by self dot size. Okay. So all, all we're doing here is we're creating a pie game rect each frame. Um, another way to do this is to store this rect at all times, and then when we do our moves, we move the rect in place. Um, I prefer to just throw away the old rectangle and start over every frame. Just draw over the top of it and pretend like that existing rectangle didn't exist before. Okay? Um, it, it's a little bit cleaner to do it this way, although... Um, Storing the rect in space allow uh, in memory space allows you to not call the garbage collector as often uh, and not cause it to thrash as much. So if you're going for something that's a little more performant, you can move things in place to save on performance speed. All right, it's completely up to you. Uh, that's a more advanced topic. So if you're following this tutorial, you're probably not to the point where you need to worry about that yet. Uh, just go along with me here and create a new rect every single frame. Okay. Then what we're going to do is we're going to come up here and fill in the draw. So we're going to say r equals self dot get rect. So we're going to grab the rectangle that we uh, and create it for where we are in space. And then we're going to say pygame dot draw dot lowercase rect. There is a difference between pygame dot rect and pygame dot draw dot rect. Uh, the difference is this actually draws the rectangle that we pass in. And we're going to draw it on the surface. We're going to draw it with self dot color and we're going to pass in that rect. And so this is the actual draw function right here. All right. So we're going to, we're going to take this rectangle that we defined down here and we're going to draw it to our surface. The last thing to fill in here is self is the move function. Self dot position is going to equal a new position. Self dot position of 
0, we're not going to move anywhere on the x-axis, so that's always going to st stay the same. Self.position1, which is the y-axis, plus self.speed. Now, why do we do it this way? Why do we reassign the position uh, using the old position? Uh, that's because tuples, you cannot manipulate them once you've created them. They are immutable, so we have to replace the tuple with a new one using the uh, the old x and y positions and then adjusting for the speed as it moves down the screen. So this is it. This is all you really need to draw to spawn new enemies and to draw them on the screen. Uh, let's make sure that we're doing this here. We've got our move function, we've got our enemy counter, and we append new enemies on here. That should be it. We should be able to see something really cool now when we go. Let's go ahead and hit play. Let's see what happens. Hopefully nothing breaks terribly. Oh, look at this. Ha ha. We've got a whole bunch of squares falling down the screen. All right. <laughs> that's that's looking pretty good. I I'm happy with this. Um it's it's a really simple graphically, but it's uh, it's getting us really close to having a full game. Now, uh for something that's a little more complicated. We're now going to have to define the player. Let's go ahead and do that. So in here, we're just going to, in the init function of the player, self.size, and we're going to set this. This the, this isn't as complicated as far as setting up because player is always going to be the same size with the same speed. Right? And self.color equals player color. Now, we don't have to store the color inside of these objects. Um, we can use the globally defined value wherever we want to. I just prefer to bring things from the global scope into the, the local object scope when I'm using them. It uh, makes the, uh, the memory locations a little bit cleaner and a little bit easier to work with. Um, and then we're going to set our position. And the player is going to start at screen width over 2 and in here we're going to do a little bit of math here all right what did we do all right so <laughs> because we count down we want to start from the bottom of the screen we want to start 10% up from the bottom of the screen so the way we do that is we take what is 10% of the screen and subtract that from the screen height. That's all we're doing here. Um, why 10%? I don't know. Arbitrarily picked it. So <laughs> it works for me. Okay. Uh, we're going to do the same thing with the player class that we did um, uh, with the enemy class. We're going to declare a get rect method here. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. Uh, this game... Uh, if we were being smart with our design and not doing this on the fly in a YouTube video, uh, I probably would have created a base class that had uh, some of these functions that are exactly the same defined in them. But this is the risk when you live code. All right, uh, here we go. So we're gonna get rect, and um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna declare our rectangle in exactly the same way, and then we're gonna draw it to the screen. We're going to get our rectangle in the draw function, and then we're going to say pygame.draw, oops, dot rect. Exactly what I told you not to do, I just did. All right. Surface, self.color, and r. All right. At this point, we have a player drawing to the screen. If we run this, you will see when the player gets created, boom, there they are, right there at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Doesn't do anything exciting yet, but he exists. There are two more functions we need to build to uh, finish out the functionality here. The first thing we're going to do is create a def move function. Now, we are going to pass in the x and y position that we want um, to move by. Now, this is not the actual x and y position to move to. This should actually be... Uh, more thought of as an X speed and a Y speed, but for simplicity, we're going to call it X, Y. 
we're going to declare a new x position, and that new x position is going to be self dot position zero plus the x that was just passed in the the delta in x. New y is going to be self dot position of y of one plus the delta y that just got passed in. Okay, then we need to do a couple of bounds checks to make sure we're not going outside of the playable space. If new x less than zero or new x greater than screen width minus player size. Look at that. All right. Um, then all we're going to do is set new x equal to self dot position zero, the original x position. So if we are going past the edge of the screen on the left or the right, don't let us move there. Set us back to the original position. Do not update the position. Okay. Then we have to do the same thing for y. Now notice I don't use an elif here. I'm just using a straight if. That's because we can move in both the x and the y position. So we do not, if we move in the x position, we do not want to skip what's happening in the y position. We want it to update. So we're going to say new y is less than screen height minus uh, player max up. So this is the max up we, de we declared at the very top here, where we're saying maximum uh, direction we can go up on the screen, okay? New y is greater than screen height minus player size. All right. If this, if either of these conditions are true, we want to not move. So set the position to the original. And then, finally, we want to say self dot position equals new x new y there it is now you now you can move the last thing we need to define inside of the player class to make this a game is collision detection so we're going to we're going to create a function called did hit and we're going to pass in a rectangle then we can say our rectangle is self dot get rect return our rectangle dot collide rect with the one that's plat, uh, the past end. That's it. That's all we have to do. Uh, so the built-in rectangle class has a collide rect. So if you have two rectangles, uh, you can use your rectangle and call collide rect with the second rectangle and check to see did a hit hit occur. It'll return true or false. Really straightforward, easy collision detection, nothing complicated, no physics engines, nothing like that. Okay. Now let's come back down to the world and actually finish this out so that we can um, update our player movements. Okay. Um, so inside the world class, uh, inside of our uh, update function, we're going to add a few things in here. After we update the score, we're going to check for player movement. Um, we're going to say if self dot move up self dot player dot move and we're going to pass in zero and minus player speed so we're going to move in the negative y direction so up negative of the player speed okay hope hope that makes sense if self dot move down Gonna do the same thing. Self dot player dot move. But this time we're gonna move in the positive direction. Player speed. Um if self dot move left, we're going to say self dot player dot move. And we're gonna do negative player speed as the x change with a zero. And the last but not least, self dot move 
right. Self dot player dot move. And we're going to do positive x change. Okay, that's it. So those are our deltas. We're going to move up, we're going to move negative, down, we're going to move positive, and left, we're going to move negative, and right, we're going to move positive. Okay. Uh, then we need to check for collisions. So inside of here, I told you we were going to add this in. Inside of the enemies uh, loop, where after we move, we are going to say if self dot player dot did hit e dot get rect. Okay, so that's why we expose the rectangle as a function here, so that we can grab it and pass it into the player. Okay. So if the player did hit, we're going to set self dot game over to true. Ta-da! That's how you get a game over. Isn't that exciting? Uh, and then, so that's everything we need to do in the update function. Now we need to handle keys. Okay. Um, let's see. We're drawing everything. We're drawing players. We're drawing that. Now we need to if event dot type equals pygame dot key down. Now in here we're gonna say if event dot key equals pygame dot k up self dot move up equals true. Okay, pretty straightforward here. Um, now all we're gonna do is we're gonna we're going to take this. I'm gonna do a lot of copy pasting here because this is a lot of text to just write. So feel free to do that as well. Oops. Helps if I indent properly. Python does not like it if you mess up your indention. Okay, so we're going to do key up, k down, and we're going to say move down is true. Ooh, down is true. k left. Move left is true. And can you guess it? I believe you can. K right. And move right is true. Okay. So if we press the key down, we're going to flip this flag to true. We're moving in the direction of the key we're pressing. Okay. Then we need a second block. If event dot type equals pygame dot key up. So we need to now see, are we releasing the key? If event.key equals pygame.k up. So this is going to look nearly identical. The difference is we're going to say self.move up equals false. So we stop moving up if we release the up key. All right, again, we can copy and paste this four times. Uh, so we're going to go k up. K down with the move down as false. Uh, K left with move left as false. And K right as move right equals false. Okay. I don't know if there's anything else we need to do here. Let's make sure. Again, major risk of doing this on the fly is I gotta make sure I put everything in here that we need. I guess the worst that happens is we run it and nothing happens. Let's try. Let's just do it and see what happens. Hey, look at this. Oh, I can move. I can move. I can move. Oh, I died. Uh oh. Wait, what happens? I died. I don't know that I died. I just know that everything stopped. Okay, so what can we do here? Um,. Well, I know if we hit the R key, I know if we hit the R key, we're going to reset and start over, okay? But as the player, we don't know this. So now we need a game over screen. That's the last thing we need to make this a fully playable game, right? So after we draw all of this text for the score on the screen, let's add one more block here. If world dot is game over, 
we want to do something. We want to say, let's say game over font, uh, game over equals font dot render game over. Great. A weight of one and a text color. And then we are going to screen dot blit the game over text. Um, let's see, where should we put this? Let's do screen width divided by three by screen height. H E I G H T. If I spell properly, divided by two. Why in the world are we doing that? Um, okay, so th I chose these numbers. These are not completely arbitrary. Uh, I know I want my game over text to start somewhere about one third of the way across the screen. I don't want it to be all the way to the left. I don't want it to be all the way to the right. I want it to start at the one third mark, and I want it to be uh, approximately in the middle of the screen. Um, you can play with these numbers and tweak them around, add pixels to move up, move down, move left, move right, whatever you need to do uh, to put it where you want to. But we're just going to do this for now. HR, let's say HR is our hit R text. Font dot render. And we're going to say hit R to reset. Same font weight, same font color. And then we're going to split this to the screen. And we're going to put it at the same, same width. I think the text, yeah, the texts are going to be different sizes. So they're going to line up on the left side. Uh, we can, we can play with that. Um, I think we're just going to leave it where it is right now. We're going to we're going to divide it by 2. When I said you can add and remove pixels to move things around, this is what I meant. Right here in the y. I'm actually going to move this 45 pixels down. Why 45? Uh because we set our font size up here to 42 pixels. So, I'm going to move it down uh 45 so that there's 3 pixels between the lines. All right, let's run it and see what happens if I die. Hopefully this is going to look good. We'll see. Blah blah blah. Oh, I died. Oh, hey, look at that. Actually, that looks pretty good. Uh, that's more than three pixels, so it wasn't quite where I expected it to put the text, but that's okay. That's good enough for now. Um, that's it. That's all we're going to do today. Uh, feel free to play with this. Modify it. Uh, go and learn how to add some, some sprites into it. We're, we'll bring in sprites in a later tutorial, but for now, uh, this is a great start to getting a game going. This is the game Dodger. Um, it's a good practice game because it gives you some movements with your arrow keys. If you want some extra exercises to do, uh, don't just do arrow keys, also do W, A, S, and D. Uh, and if you really want to get experimental, see if you can get mouse movement. Follow your mouse around the screen with the player character uh, and dodge it that way. Adjust the numbers, add sprites. There's a lot you can do to expand on this, but this should give you a great place to start. Now, if you really liked this and you want to see more tutorials, I've got more coming out. Uh, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. Uh, also, uh, hit the like button if you like this. Show people that this is a great video. Um, if you don't think it's a great video, I'm sorry. Leave, in a, leave a comment. I'll see if I can make changes in future videos to appease all of the YouTube gods. All right, so thank you. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.